Hello Booktube, I'm back today with not one, but two uh, female-focused spin-offs or retellings of the Odyssey. Uh, the first is The Penelope Ad by Margaret Atwood, and the second is Cersei by Madeline Miller, which is the book that we are reading this week in the Poptimist Discord book club, um, and we'll be chatting about that at the end of the month, so there's still time for you to read the book and join in the chats, and I will link to that Discord server down below to come and join us. Uh, but yeah, today I'm going to talk about both of these books. Um, I'll try and avoid spoilers, but there might be some spoilery stuff uh, going on. So if you don't want to be spoiled, uh, this is not the video for you. But if you have read these books, please do hang around, because I'd love to hear your thoughts about them as well. So the Penelope ad, first of all, is uh, the more experimental of the two. Uh, it's slightly older, I think, when was it published? It was published in 2005, where Cersei, of course, came out early this year or late last year. Uh, so by Mark Edward, famous for all kinds of uh, things, mainly in Handmade Steel, but many other books as well. And the Penelope ad is almost a play. Um, I think I've seen a play version of it as well. I'm not quite sure if that was the original version or is an adaptation, but you can definitely see how it would work as a play. Uh, so in the Penelope ad, we get Penelope uh, telling us her story and her side of the story, how she experienced the events of the Odyssey, interspersed by uh, the chorus formed up of the handmaidens or house slaves uh, that are hanged in one of the later books of the Odyssey after uh, Odysseus has returned home. And they're hanged because they uh, allegedly slept with the shooters. And so... Atwood kind of balances these two perspectives um, where and, and, and kind of throws into doubt both Odysseus's version of events uh, as we get through the Odyssey as well as Penelope's version of events um, as we get through here. And so it's a very experimental style of book, so especially the, the chapters where we get the handmaids forming the chorus and commenting kind of in the uh, ancient Greek style, as, as the chorus would do in ancient Greek theatre. Um, but they kind of form, you know, they kind of speak in the form of poetry and of song lyrics. Uh, and so it kind of makes a very disjointed reading experience, which I think would work very well as a play. And works as well on the page as well, but uh, probably would work better as a play. Um, and actually, for the whole, the whole book is almost a play and therefore would work better as a play. Um, because in the end, uh, although I think it's a good book, I didn't enjoy the Penelope yet that much, but I think a large part of that is due to the, it not being the book I wanted to read, which of course is not Atwood's fault. Um, it's just a mismatch in, in what I was looking for at the time that I read it. So I read this just after finishing Emily Wilson's um, Odyssey translation. and. I was kind of hoping for the story from Penelope's side where we get to so Penelope's side of the story where we get to see a bit more of what happened uh, in Ithaca while Odysseus was away and have that a bit more fleshed out. Um, but that's not what we get in the Penelope ad. So we do get Penelope telling her side of the story, but it's it's very much telling, right? It's not a first person narrative of what happened. It is Penelope in the here and now talking to us about what happened in the past. Which might sound the same as a first person narrative set in the past, but it's not. Right? It's, it's kind of hard to really articulate, but it's it's very much Penelope here and now telling us what happened, rather than uh, such as, for example, Cersei, which is a first person narrative. Which is, even and even though it's narrated, you know, in the, the, Cersei is narrated in the past tense, it still feels very different than just someone here and now telling us about the past. Um, also means in the Penelope ad uh, that you know things aren't really fleshed out. So we are told a lot about what happened with the shooters, but we don't really get to see any of the scenes um, that are alluded to or, or maybe not even mentioned at all in the Odyssey. Again, it's just Penelope kind of saying that things happened, but not really filling in the scene. Uh, and finally, there's the character of Penelope herself, as Atwood gives Penelope a very clear and distinctive voice, uh, which is very good. Um, 
but unfortunately it's, it's not the voice I was hoping for. So in the Odyssey, uh, in Emily Wilson's translation of Odyssey, we get people using modern languages, but very clearly being ancient Greeks or pre-ancient Greeks um, and having a different mindset to our own. Whereas in the Penelope ad, um, Penelope is kind of like uh, a, a early middle-aged or, or you know, late 30s, 40s American housewife. Uh, almost what I would say she's like, you know, could have walked off the, 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 out of Desperate Housewives. And so I think Edward does it very skillfully and it gives Penelope this very clear, distinctive voice and, and personality and character. But it's not the Penelope from the Odyssey. And, you know, obviously there's no imperative that it should be. I mean, this is a retelling and Atwood is absolutely free to uh, make Penelope whoever she wants to make Penelope. It's, it's her Penelope, not, not Homer's Penelope. And she, she's not obliged to stick to Homer's Penelope. But if, yeah, if that's not the book you're looking for, um, that's a bit disappointing. So, like I said, it's, it's not the book's fault, but it wasn't what I was looking for. Um, and, and that's kind of tempered my enjoyment of uh, what's otherwise a good book. Now, Cersei, on the other hand, um, also takes a uh, somewhat minor female character uh, from the Odyssey. Minor in the sense that she has an important story role to play. She doesn't get much uh, screen time, so to speak, uh, and fleshes out the story. But Cersei, unlike Penelope, is, is, is a you know, classical first-person narrative where we really get to follow the main character throughout her life. Um, so, of course, we get the scenes where Odysseus comes to visit, as we know from the Odyssey. Cersei also uh, has connections with the uh, myth of the Minotaur and of Jason and Argonauts. I'm not quite sure how much of that is, is kind of made up by Madeleine Miller um, and how much is based on the mythical tradition, but it works very well. And, yeah, it's... it's basically kind of a, a coming of age story where we follow Cersei who is a, a water nymph and we follow her through her life as she kind of figures out you know, what to do with her life, what it means to be mortal, immortal, what the point of life ultimately is or what you can make of it. And I really, really enjoyed this book. Um, this, the characters were very compelling. Um, and, and felt much more true to the Odyssey. And then again, you know, it's a personal preference, not an objectively good thing, but I really enjoyed that. So although we do get, you know, it's, it's clearly a book written in the 21st century, but probably the mere fact that you take Cersei as a main character already is something that wouldn't have happened in Homer's time. But somehow, the, still feels more about that you're reading about fantastical characters rather than someone you could meet down at the supermarket. Um, and there's yeah lots of beautiful writing. So the, the writing doesn't stand out by itself in, in the sense it's very poetic um, or uh, there's a lot of good imagery, but you know, no, no huge quotes or really playing with language that, that stand out, but there are lots of subtle things that go on. Uh, so Cersei, for example, is a water nymph, um, and because she's a narrator, she then uses lots of, especially at the beginning of the story, which is much more connected to being a water nymph, she uses lots of kind of water-based imageries and metaphors and related to the sea and to rivers and, and the action of water, which I thought was you know, kind of clever. So it adds the characterization of Cersei and then Kind of keeps you in the right mood without really drawing attention to itself and so it was, it was something i really enjoyed there also lots of subtle interweaving of greek myths and uh, our current knowledge of the, the history and prehistory of the eastern mediterranean uh, which i liked a lot and yeah and just all a very compelling story um, that casts new light on a lot of characters um, from the Greek mythology, and, and especially on Odysseus. 
So this is going towards more spoilery discussion. Um, so of course Odysseus visits Circe. Um, as we know from the Odyssey, we all know what happens there. At least if you took part in the Odyssey, read along, or read the Odyssey before then. But we also get to see what happens to Odysseus afterwards, um, through Circe's son with Odysseus going to visit him, and then uh, Penelope and Telemachus coming to visit Circe. And I think that kind of extrapolates from the ending of the Odyssey, but in a very believable, believable way. So uh, in my Odyssey video, I talked about you know, the Odyssey being about coming home after a war and how to end the cycle of violence and then kind of find peace. And Odysseus, you know, the, the, there are very strong hints that Odysseus may not be able, may not be capable of doing this. And Madeline Miller in, in, in Cersei kind of extrapolates that, in fact, Odysseus won't be able to leave the war behind him. and will gradually descend into you know, paranoia and bouts of violence because he is incapable of being a peacetime ruler or, or living in peace anymore. Uh, so again, kind of staying, compared to Edward, staying more true to the original characters um, and, and developing them in, in a way that seems logical from uh, how they are portrayed in the Odyssey while making it her own story as well. And um, a final interesting point I'd like to discuss regarding Cersei uh, is the marketing. What I find very interesting is that Cersei seems to be marketed as um, general or literary fiction. And, and I think it's been quite successful. If you like, look on Booktube, um, who is talking about Cersei or has talked about Cersei or mentioned it, those are Booktubers that generally stick to general or literary fiction, rather than fantasy and science fiction booktubers. Um, I don't follow very many booktubers who, who read a lot of fantasy, or certainly none I think that read primarily fantasy, but I haven't heard them mention Cersei at all. And that's odd to me because Cersei is very much a fantasy story. Right? If you forget the marketing for a second and look at the kind of themes and what happens in the story. So it's a story set in an alternate version of our world in the past, where magic exists, where gods are real, uh, and it follows a, a coming of age story uh, of a person who kind of goes on a hero's journey and has to you know, shape their life and their ethics and, and find the meaning of life and how to, you know, has to find uh, you know, gain power to not necessarily def defeat evil, but to shape their destiny at least, uh, and, and has to come to terms with how to deal with that power and, and perhaps even to let it go when the time is there. And all of those are very much fantasy themes, right? Um, if you look at, at, fant at fantasy novels, those are themes you will find. The, the presence of gods and, and magic being real, it's not magical realism or, or like in the satanic verses where you know certainly the devil is real whether god is real is arguable uh, as i said in the last video but it's also very much a literary device to kind of explore questions that the russian wanted to explore but here it's an essential part of the world building right it's it's the gods aren't introduced just to have a literary device to to be able to talk about some question but you know there is this world where gods exist, and that's just how that world works, and this is a story that happens to take place in that world. So if all of that, if I had to say what genre is this, this is very much a fantasy book, uh, and yet somehow it's not regarded as a fantasy book. Um, it's marketed and seems to be received as um, literary fiction, or, or at least general fiction, and it's quite interesting to me. Um, I don't know if that's in part of it is maybe because there is maybe a bit of a blurring between let's say mainstream and fantasy as a genre but still it's, it's kind of interesting. I was wondering, you no, know, because I think in part must have been a conscious decision on the part of the publishers of the book to market it not as fantasy because I could have. So I'm wondering if they would have changed the reception of the book 
uh, if it had been marketed as fantasy, uh, if it would have changed who read it. Um, and yeah, why it isn't, in spite of the marketer's best efforts, classed as fantasy anyway? Is it because it's based on the Odyssey, and therefore, which is a great work of literature, and therefore it is literary fiction? You know, which is odd. I mean, the Odyssey itself is arguably fantasy, if you had to put it in a genre now. Um, and, you know, there's definitely are other works that have been based on the Odyssey and the Iliad, uh, Dan Simmons's um, Iliad and Olympus, uh, sorry, Ilium and Olympus, which are both uh, also great books, by the way, but those are both very much classed as science fiction, and rightfully so, but so just the mere fact of it being based on the Odyssey, you'd think wouldn't be enough to take it out of being a fantasy genre. So yeah, I find it interesting that despite all its fantasy trappings, it's not regarded as fantasy. Anyway, that's uh, my thoughts for now. Uh, if you've read either of or both of these books um, yourself, I would love to hear your thoughts on them in the comments down below. Uh, and that was all for me for now. Until next time, bye bye.